Happy New Year, Seamsiders. To get 2024 started right, I thought I would pull together some of my favorite moments out of the last year as a way of not only reflecting and looking back, but mining it again for the wisdom, the advice, the perspective and experience that my guests have offered in hopes of setting all of us up for a more creative, more fulfilling, more satisfying 2024. But before we jump into that, a couple notes of housekeeping. Number one, I continue to love your reviews rolling in. They are so sweet. Listen to this one from Ann and Jay. I'm assuming you're writing from New Jersey. If so, thank you very much. Ann says, Zach always gets me thinking. Five stars. I love this podcast because it never fails to inspire. Zach's take on creativity are something special in the quilting world. If you know what Ann's talking about, you're listening to the sound of my voice right now and you think, you know what? Seems I'd really is something special in the quilting world. I sure would appreciate your kind five-star review on Apple Podcast. It is the best way to help other people discover the magic that is Seamside. If the beginning of a new year has you scratching your head and wondering how are you going to invest in yourself and your creative practice, how are you going to find your quilty creative community? Y'all know what I'm going to recommend. I love the Quilty Nook. Every day that passes, it just gets more and more special. And that's very little to do with my role in all this. I just set the ball rolling and it's picked up steam, y'all. It's like this beautiful quilty snowball. So if you're interested in meeting like-minded creative folks, you want a little accountability in the new year, perhaps, when it comes to creative projects, or maybe you just want some company. You like the idea of sewing circles almost every day of the week and workshops once a month. And I haven't even told you about our new experimental quilt along called Destroy This Quilt. I'm just telling you, there's something happening every day on the nook. There's so much to love. I hope you'll join us. Check out that link down in the show notes below if you're curious for your free trial to the Nook in 2024. Now, y'all, when I sat down to begin thinking, who would I pull in from the last year of Seamside? It was a lot more challenging than I thought. I had no idea. I thought I'd be able to just click, click, click and be done. But I don't know about you, but these conversations for me have been deeply inspiring and formative in my own creative practice. And so to just pick you know, half a dozen clips really turned out to be tough. In the end, I tried to pick a wide variety of folks who were sharing stories that inspired, that motivated, or offered some kind of insight or perspective. So I hope that no matter where you are on your quilty journey right now, no matter where you are in your creative practice, whether you're feeling full of inspiration or maybe a little bit, maybe things are on the quiet side, Regardless, I hope you find some good medicine here to get you started on the right foot in 2024. The first clip that I pulled was with a conversation with Alice Gab. Alice is a banner maker, a calligrapher, an activist in the UK, and Alice and I had a wonderful conversation about what it means to be human and to connect and to cross bridges. We talk about the kind of relationships that I want to cultivate more of in my life in this new year. So we start here with the story of how Alice first came to America. I was 30 and it was when I, my calligraphy career was kind of really taking off and I was part of a network of calligraphers that were very much based in the US because it's, it was much bigger there than it was in the UK. It was, we were just kind of following on from them. And so I did a call out if anyone would have this, this English person to come and stay and that I would just help assist in their studios. That was my kind of selling point I was like I'll come in I can like pack orders or I can yeah if I can come and stay and I didn't think anyone would say yes but four people said yes from all over America and they didn't want me to help them in their studio they wanted me to teach them how to teach calligraphy because I was running workshops pretty successfully at the time in London and so that's what I did I went to stay all over and I was very tired by the end. It it was just, it felt very palpable, the politics at the time. It wasn't just that Trump was being inaugurated. It was also that Brexit was happening in the UK. And I made my way around America and ended up in Oakland. 
And I was sat in a bar that was an old music hall and I noticed a banner that said universal toleration. And for something that was clearly old, like it was clearly over a hundred years old. I just thought that like that lettering just stuck out so much to me, that phrase. And there had been many, many bits of language that I had been playing over in my mind the whole time I was there. No justice, no peace, not my president. Like these phrases were just kind of floating around, but I really couldn't see how I could how that would work with my calligraphy career like I just couldn't see how that was relevant or it just wasn't the right format and so I saw this banner and I just was like this is it this is I started researching where that phrase came from and I was pretty shocked when I found out that it was from a mutual aid group in England from Manchester I made an exhibition when I got back of language surrounding that group their founding values were friendship love and truth and yeah I just in a time where everything was just so heated and divided I was just really drawn to like community outside of a church and outside of government and now I make banners full time you just never know which way life's gonna take you yeah yeah I I was in Phoenix for Arizona for the Women's March. I was staying with a family that had let me come and stay to help teach calligraphy. And there hadn't been any discussion of it beforehand, but they happened to be a very strict Mormon family. And so they were vehemently against the march. But we had really connected when I stayed and... There was just this really loving act where it was not questioned when I said that I wanted to go. And that we lived like half an hour drive away from the march. And and the person that had me to say was just like, I'm taking you, no, no problem at all. I'll take you and I'll pick you up. And it was just such, it was so loving. And I, yeah, I really won't forget that. They're actually coming to London next month and I can't, I can't wait to see them. I think that's an incredible example of the kind of moment that I personally want to cultivate more of in my life and in this world, which is in that space beyond rhetoric and in that space beyond uh, meme speak and in that space beyond we would consider what we would label politics, right? Because Mm -hmm. folks have their views, but we can also still find meaningful connection in ways that are really rich and really nuanced, like the ones you just shared with this family in Phoenix. It really tested me on that level because at the same time as we had this beautiful connection and I had a great time, I also didn't feel safe enough to tell them that I was queer. And I also didn't feel like that would, at the time, I actually wonder whether that's changed since, but at the time, I don't think that would have gone down very well. And so that was also this, really heavy heavy weights of yeah I can find these beautiful things but at the same time does their deep beliefs mean that me and my friends wouldn't be able to coexist here like safely I don't know I wonder whether we'll get to talking about that when when they come over because now like I they didn't know I was queer but now they do <laughs> because I put, I put it on my banners and I don't need I'm not staying in their home anymore I don't need to don't need to hide that so yeah who knows well and this is a thing I think a lot about too is that in cultivating these kinds of relationships that really just kind of stretch us mm-hmm. you know philosophically mm-hmm. politically or whatnot like I think it's unreasonable for us to expect that we're going to have the same kind of friendships, warm fuzzies, and comfort with mm-hmm. someone when we're already so stretched, like when we're already doing a lot of work just to cross the divide. Mm. You know, it's I don't even know if that's something we can aim for. I want everybody to feel safe, of course, but I just don't know if we'll feel comfortable in every relationship that we're going to have, especially if ones where we're trying to cultivate very intentionally a different kind of dynamic. Yeah, so but. true. I really appreciate in this conversation how Alice shared this example of what it means to have an honest and full relationship with 
people that you may not necessarily see eye to eye on with different political or philosophical things. I know in 2024, I will be reaching out to those people in my life who perhaps the relationships are a little on the cool side and could use some, some warming up. Nothing like a quilter knows how to do that, right? In this next clip, I talked to Judy Martin. I loved this whole conversation with Judy. This is the one and only seam side where I've ever swapped poetry with one of my guests, and that was just one of the many things that made this chat so special. Judy talks about significant textile projects, thinking about the themes of mortality and the passage of time, and how to embrace the unpredictability of, of life. We talk in this clip about how textiles can operate as vessels or carriers that give us access to a deep space within. So let's listen to Judy here talk about this project that took her over three years to make. I think I was 58 and um, I thought I'm going to be 60 one of these days. So on my 58th birthday, I started working with an entire skein of embroidered floss for each day. I just did a daily practice of stitching this whole thing onto a piece of artist canvas. Uh, I, it was b a big enough for my lap. I, I held this canvas and I would take all my extra cloth, my found cloth. I, ha I was a quilt maker. I was a clothing maker. I had a lot of scraps and I would just uh, couch a strip of cloth to the canvas until the cloth ran out, until and until I ran out of one skein. So I kept doing that one a day for three years until I turned 61. And it's uh, 220 feet long and uh, 13 inches wide. And there's pictures of it on my website. And I wrote a little book about it uh, called Not to Know But to Go On. And that, that, those words are actually Agnes Martin's words. She talks about everything is perfect, but nothing is perfect. Um, being alone, artists should be alone, and she talks about not knowing but going on and uh, in her beautiful writing. And so I have this little book that I uh, I wrote, and people are snapping it up. And what's in the it's book? It's just then? one of my blog posts. It just talks about how how I made this quilt by not looking at what color the embroidery floss skein was, just sticking my hand in there and blindly choosing a color and then having it in my hand and saying, oh, no, but I'm still working on this blue cloth and I picked this purple thread. It's not going to look good, but I would use it anyway because that's what the day brought. It brought me a purple and I had to use it anyway. And I had to use up all that blue cloth. You know, I had to go to right to the I had used it all up. Somebody told me this whole piece was about mortality because I was cleaning my, my studio, I was finalizing things, I was ending things, and I was also talking about how fast each day goes by. It's just a whirl, you know. Uh, all of a sudden there are your three years and your 220 feet. Um, and by the way, the purple looked fantastic with the blue, as did all of the colors with every day. It looked fine once you put them all together. <laughs> no need to worry. We'll share a picture of that piece with the show, with the episode here. So people can see it because for me, one of the most impactful moments that you capture in that project is you've rolled out the whole piece and it wins its way through this kind of green lawn foresty floor. And it feels like an invitational path to, mm -hmm. to walk along and see where it I takes you. I think it also talks as a metaphor about how we just have to approach this world that is quite worrisome sometimes and we really don't know we really don't know what the next day will bring but we just have to carry on and, and do our best and it'll work out and it might not work out but we still not to know but go on and yeah that those pictures are from my my blog post about it and that's that's what the book is too i'm wondering if judy you would like to read for us something that you've written i'm thinking particularly of maybe unfolding in trees, not thinking? Yeah. Or maybe you had something else well, you'd like to I, share. The reason I wrote this poem, which I guess it is a poem, is because I was making a piece that was tall and silky and with a little bit of velvet. But I'd also made a lot of tucks in it, and it looked like kind of like a tower or a ladder. And it was, by working on it, I was 
every time I do handwork, I go into this kind of dream world. And so I, I just was, I just, I, I guess that's what enough set up for what, what I'm going to read then. Um, the pictures are of this piece that looks like a big, tall ladder, I guess, hanging in a tree, hanging from a tree. So the title is Unfolding in the Trees, Not Thinking. A vertical piece like a tower like something from another century with stairways that go up into the attic, where there is a fairy window, where there is a daydream, where there is poetry. There are no storms, not really. Where we stop reading, where we stop thinking, where we recognize, yet continue upward, past the round window that doesn't open, towards the ceiling so high. It's a narrow space, like I said, it's a tower. It's intimate, close and soft and dreamy. The round window watches. It sees your memory. It views your dream. Oh, your serene face. I know it's a cover-up. I know it's a blanket. I know you are alone. Is part of that poem for you a wish or a hope for somebody? A hope or a wish for somebody. I'm, I think it, it was just to me. It was my own self. Um, and I'm talking about this quilt, and I think the last part, I know it's a cover-up. I know it's just a blanket. You have a serene face, but there's so much going on, you know. There's so much going on in our inner, in our inner worlds, and, and I think it's not just me. Everybody has a lot going on. I think it speaks to not only the journey, similar to what we're talking about with not to know, but to go on, you know, this kind of pathway that this piece feels like now, instead of going horizontally across the landscape, we're climbing into this tower. But it's not only the journey, it's also speaking, to me at least, of the, the power that textiles have to be both very a very known quantity, a very domestic quantity, and simultaneously something with power and something transformative. The thing that, that's the space as a quilter I like to operate in because I feel like when people look at some of my pieces and they're like, for example, this one I'm working on now, they're like, oh, it's a towel. I know what a towel is. That gives me room to say, mm -hmm. oh yeah? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this towel again. Yeah, and I think also, Yes, it's certainly for the viewer who looks at it and recognizes the towel. But it also is for us, the makers, when we work with the textiles, as we're handling them and as we're making them into shapes and towers or quilts. Or We are also working with our body, like our body is repetitively, if we're doing handwork, which both you and I do, stitching. and. That motion and being able to, it's just something rhythmic that sets us off, sets me off anyway, as I, into this dream world, into this huge, immense, vast place that is the inside of me. And that's why I love making textiles. And I want to try and make that feeling in my textiles for other people to get just from looking at because they know what they t feel like. Everybody knows what cloth feels like. We touch it all the time. But to have that kind of poetic resonance is what it's called with an, a something, just like you have when you look at the moon or when you look at the sunset or when you... It just makes you go into your own self. I love how Judy frames her mission. I don't know if she would call it that, but her mission with her textile work is trying to open up interior spaces for people. What a lovely way to look at what we do. The next clip I pulled for us was from a collaborative project that I did with Amanda Nadig. You may remember the necktie quilt and the two-parter mini documentary series. Never done anything like that before, but it was so good. And I'm thinking that maybe in this new year, you might be interested in yourself stretching your creative limits a little bit and maybe having a collaboration of your own. So in this part of the Necktie Quilt series, Amanda and I share some reflections on what made this particular collaboration go so well 
with the hopes that you too will find some guidance and a framework in finding your own collaborations. What are some of the things that you've experienced, work with me or other collaborations, that you feel like it's important to keep in mind? I mean, you just touched on one that I feel like is so key, which is you got to have an unbridled respect for the other person's work. Because otherwise, I feel like you're always going to be second guessing each other and it's going to be more of a tension and a struggle as opposed to an exercise in trust, like a trust fall. Mm -hmm. Definitely start with a trust fall. Into a quilt, maybe. Yeah, big um, pile of quilts. <laughs> put a pile of quilts down before you do the trust fall, just in case that test doesn't work. I would say I have a tip on choosing someone to collaborate with. If I were to try to work with someone who would not be comfortable with me to just like move forward and chop a big chunk out of something that was already maybe took three hours to hand stitch, like you're okay with that because you know that like that wasn't a waste of time to do all that hand stitching and then chop that right out. Like that could be really difficult for some folks. Like let's just leave it in because it took so much time to do. Mm. But I feel like, and also just like, obviously that could go back to like, are you someone that measures a lot? And is the other person someone who can just like lay their hand down and say, okay, this is enough. So I guess it's not perfectionism because I do think you and I are perfectionists, but we're not like perfectionists in the, we're perfectionists in the areas that are similar. Mm -hmm. We're <laughs> like, we want, I don't know. I don't know how to describe that. I think to say we're not perfectionists is wrong. No, we, we just both don't we want to a use vision. a ruler. We yeah, we perfect, have. A... We want to perfect our vision. Yeah, we want to perfect our vision, and we're willing to work hard to make that happen. Yeah, and cut and hunks out and start over. And right, right, mm -hmm. starting over and taking a lot of stitches out. So I think what I really find joy in working with you is like, and you have to find this person that wh whatever it is that you enjoy about your process. And part of my process is I love being able to just dive in and kind of experiment. And that said, I mean, it could be really interesting to work with someone who had a very different process, mm. but I would think communication would be even more important in that situation. Oh, yes, yes. Just to be like, hey, you know, here's some of the ways we're different. Let's be aware of that going into the project and let's just keep talking through when we when we come to those areas where we need to talk things. So that's a really good point because one of the best parts of a collaboration is your creative partner approaching something very different from you. Without that, you're not learning and growing and your process isn't going to evolve mm -hmm. because now my process is I have some quilts that I want to make that I would never have dreamed of after this because of some stuff that I learned that you do. Some things that you pay attention to that I don't usually pay attention to. So I really appreciate that. Like I wouldn't have done some of this overlapping of these sheer fabrics. And now I'm like so excited about trying that. It's something I was trying to just skip over. But you said, no, we need to go back. And so those those moments are really great. Oh, this is what I wanted to say. <laughs> I was like, I know this is going somewhere. Yeah. But in saying that, when when I will give an idea and then you said, or the other way around, I don't think that should happen because of this. If that's difficult for you to hear and that would make you like want to march out of the room or quit, then that's probably not the person you want to collaborate with. You have to be open to like, I guess compromise mm -hmm. and stopping and being like, well, well, why didn't you like my idea? Like what? I mean, that we never said that, but you know, I would say more of... than compromise is trust, right? Like yeah, it's not even compromise. like if the person, cause I never felt like, cause I, I never, yeah, I didn't feel like I was settling like, Oh, you don't like my idea. Okay. Exactly. But I felt comfortable telling you when I wasn't okay with you liking yeah. my idea. I mean, I didn't say it like that. Like you don't like my idea. I'm not okay <laughs> with that. But I'd be like, well, but I, I didn't like settle and say, okay, we'll just always do it your way. Like you don't right. want that either. No, that's not fun. But that's I'm sure fun. that that happens sometimes in collaborations. Sure, sure. And then the other person feels a little bummed mm -hmm. and you don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I feel like when you propose something that I couldn't quite see yet, as long as I heard like a why, like mm -hmm. you say, we should, we should add this pink here because it connects to this pink over here or whatever it was. As long as there's a why, then like game on, let's go forward. Right. I feel like you're really yeah. good at providing your reasoning behind wanting to do certain things, even if it's like a very intuitive based reasoning. Yeah. And that's so interesting because when you work alone, you make those decisions and you don't have to explain to anyone why you do them, which is fine. 
But it really is a good practice to whether that be writing it down, like if you are working alone, like making an Instagram post about your process. It's really interesting to kind of reflect why why do I need that to happen? It's a good creative practice. So you could talk out loud to yourself or mm-hmm. you could just have another person listening to yeah, you. Yeah, get say your that. cat in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could tell your dog all these things. <laughs> I have to laugh because I'm sitting here in my bedroom recording this and right behind me is a giant stack of quilts. So like, I'm just ready for that trust fall, y'all. I don't know about you. Up next is my buddy, Paolo Arau. In this clip, we're discussing his transition from quilt-like fabric paintings to hand-woven pieces in his most recent show called Loom Songs. And he called it Loom Songs because he also has a background in music. So what I love about this conversation is Paolo shows us just one way of how we can bring together multiple passions and interests that we may have into one creative practice. Yeah, so Loom Songs was a solo exhibition that I recently had at Morgan Lehman Gallery in Chelsea. Um, And it was the first time that I had exhibited all handwoven work. Because prior to then, I had been exhibiting more sewn, quilted, well, well, using quilt-like processes, but not necessarily quilted, uh, fabric paintings. And so Loom Songs was the very first time that I I exhibited um, handwoven pieces. And why I decided to call the show Loom Songs refers directly to my background as a classical pianist. Growing up, I I played the piano. I went to college to study music and performance. I thought that I was going to be a classical pianist, um, but that obviously didn't happen. But music has always still remained. It lingers. You know, it's I, I the way that I make work um, and the way that I think about music are similar. Ooh, say more about that. There is a language that both music and visual arts share. And when you're talking about color, composition, and harmony, and rhythms, and you know dissonance, and things like that, of that nature, for me, the, the loom really feels like playing at the piano, like sitting down at the piano. You know, it's, it's this instrument that your body is in tune with. You know, there is a rhythm. There's this natural rhythm that occurs. And I was thinking about the loom as this instrument and thinking about the possibility or thinking about making threads sing, if that makes any sense. Because oftentimes when I work with textiles, before I even begin, it all starts with color. And what I, what I end up doing, especially when I'm sewing pieces, is I'll sew bands of different colors together. To me, that becomes this chord right? It it creates the tone of the key, whether it's a major or a minor key, and then all things go from there. And so, um, and the same is similar with working on the loom, you know, I have like different spools of thread, and then I sort of create this visual chord. And to me, it's like seeing sound and then hearing color. Even when I was a painter, making paintings in the traditional sense, I always would think about color in terms of definitely in terms of dissonance and then trying to find harmony in that dissonance you know it's not always trying to go for the most tasteful palette right off the block you know it's like i'll go to the paint box and look for like the really ugly colors that i've neglected and not paid attention to and and think like oh how, how can we make you like sing how can we bring you into the choir here and let's get this song going how would you describe the the Paolo Couture custom palette? Like, what is? <laughs> how would you describe your color sensibility? Oh, jeez. I mean, looking back now, I think that there's there's a lot of um, loud, bright, bold colors, and a lot of these colors are referencing palettes that are that are very familiar to me, and palettes that I've seen on visits to the Philippines, you know, that there's like these really bold and then sometimes really off-putting colors, but then they work in this like really magical way. Like they're not supposed to, but then they do. And they're just intriguing. It's like, I can't stop thinking about them. So I guess my palette is, it's similar in that sense where I take a lot of bold color and then sometimes a lot of color that that's a little too harsh or a little too, um, I think harsh is, is not the right word. It's a little too loud, I guess. And I just try to make that work. 
in a way that's that's wrong but feels right. I like just being just kind of wrong, but also like right in the way that I'm I'm seeing it. I love that. I'm writing it down. A way that feels wrong but is right. Yeah. That's wonderful. Paolo, another piece that I knew I want to talk to you about that you made some time back. I saw it once and it just has kind of lodged itself in my mental battery of images. And that was the series of pieces that you made inspired by Filipino sales. Yep. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and what those mean to you? Yeah. So I made those Vinta sales in 2020 when I was on a residency at the Bemis Center in Oma. And at the time, I was researching a lot of textiles from the Philippines, mainly weaving. But in the book that I was reading, an image of these sales came up and it just, there was just something that really hit me. It just stopped me because they felt so much like the sewn paintings that I was making. Like there was this connection to not only the geometry of them, but the color. It just felt like I was seeing one of my paintings on a sail, like on a boat, right? I was just like, wow, this is so interesting. And so, you know, these Vinta sails, they're on these outrigger boats in the Southern Philippines. And a lot of the people who have these boats make their sails for their boats. So they're highly individual. And I believe that there is there is this festival that happens where everyone breaks out their outrigger boats. And then it's just the whole shoreline is lined with all these colorful sails. But it's just, it's just breathtaking to think of the color and the pattern floating on the water in that way. Um, it's just really magical. And so... I was at the Bema Center in, in Omaha, which is, you know, the first time that I ever spent a long period of time in the Midwest and in a landlocked state. And so it had me thinking about missing the water because all my life I've always grown up close to the water. And to me, being in Omaha, I was at this residency for three months. It was just, it was this sense of feeling out of place. And I love this idea of these sales having nowhere to go really and it's just like you know i wanted to see them in this place it was to me feeling or responding to that out of placeness if that makes sense and so because i was at this residency there were these enormous installation spaces that were available to us and that just allowed me to dream big and then also to realize those dreams while I was there. And so when I saw that image, I was like, you know, I have to, this feels so much about what I'm feeling right now. There is nothing quite like textiles to help make a cold, unfamiliar place feel a little bit more like home. And I love that's what Paolo did here with those Venta sales. Another really tender conversation that I had this year was with quilter Julian Jamal Jones. In this particular part of our conversation, Julian shares his thoughts on how to title his artwork. And there's this mechanism, this dynamic with how he names his pieces that creates these inner circles, right? Julian will say he's up front with letting us know that he's a private person. You know, he doesn't want everybody in on his business, but he also wants to provide the viewer of his work some kind of a context. And so he does that by pulling in lyrics from rap songs or Bible verses or a variety of places. So let's listen to Julian talk about how he builds those inner circles with himself and his audience. You just said something that made me feel like I haven't done my homework, Julian. <laughs> and that is, <laughs> you mentioned paper in your quilts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So, you know, okay, so talking about the pandemic, I was sketching and, you know, you know, I always started in love with abstraction. And I feel like abstraction is such a, it's either a right answer or a wrong answer. I feel like, I feel like I'm never right when I talk about abstraction, but I feel like abstraction is such, it's a way for me to feel private and coded but still put my process and my in my work out there in the real world. Again, I'm a very private individual. I was raised in a very concealed family. There was a lot of things that my parents protected us on. So I feel like a lot of the work that I put out is very 
it's open to interpretation. I don't want to put a theme or narrative to the practice or to the pieces. I think now though I'm starting to title my works now. That's a new thing for me now. Titling that in the very beginning was very hard for me to really connect something with my work because the whole goal is for me not to put anything on my audience. I want my work to be, if you walk into a solo show of my works, I want all my works to be open to interpretation. I don't want anything to be forced. I don't want any type of, I want people to leave my exhibit with their own interpretations. But I think now, I think putting or connecting some element within my work I think it's more successful than what I used to say about untitling my works. So like the new body, the, the works that I'm making now in 2023 all have titles. You know, some of them are song titles. One, one title was from a Bible verse and I did that I like. It's one of my favorite Bible verses now that I think about it. So I think now, you know, I think the work now is kind of pulling from all avenues which it always has been, but I'm starting to title my practice. So what changed your mind about titling your work? Um, I felt like I, I owed my audience some type of information. <laughs> There's one quilt that hasn't been seen yet. It's actually going to London for a show with Truly Art Projects, and I named it Now I Got 32 Flavors. Now, if you don't listen to rap music, you don't know where, that's, where I'm pulling those references from. But if you if you if you know crime mob, if you understand the rap culture, you know where I'm pulling those lyrics from. So I feel like now I'm pulling excerpts from from Bible verses. I'm pulling some some lyrics, you know, it's still like this mystery thing. But I feel like it's I'm connect, I'm trying to connect my audience to something, you know, like I'm trying to give them some type of information, but I don't want to give them too much. Well, and you said something a moment ago that I find really interesting about uh -huh. naming the quilt that's going to London after 32 yeah. flavors that like, it almost creates this little test, doesn't it? That if you yes. read the title, Absolutely. you're either in or you're out, right. right? Yeah. And that's exactly what I want. Like, your reaction is exactly how I want people to read my work. And I think one thing about me is like, I like to tease people. I'm a teaser. I like to, I like to put things out there for the world, but I want people to do their research. So it's kind of like rap music. It's kind of like one of those things, like if you read a rap lyric, I kind of get what the rapper is trying to say. He's talking about his mother, his baby mama, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> so that's kind of, I'm, I'm trying to pull that, that con conceptual aspect in my practice where I'm naming things, but I want my audience to do their research and kind of understand what I'm coming from. This conversation has me thinking about how I name my own quilts. When they get named, they don't always do, but it seems like it's just kind of a natural part of the sewing process to wait and see what words or phrases kind of float to the top of mind as I'm sewing. And so that's where a lot of my names come from, just from the stories behind the quilts themselves. You may remember that in the fall of 2023, I got turned down for a really exciting residency that I could just, I could taste it. I could feel it. It was so close. And in the wake of that disappointment, I reached out to a bunch of my friends and had them share thoughts about how they navigate those turbulent, disappointing waters in their own creative and professional practices. There's a whole crew that came together for that episode, How to Say Yes in the Face of No. But I'm pulling one here for my buddy Sylvan Robinson, another artist here in Brooklyn, who's an activist and embroiderer. Both of us just so happen to have pieces in the same Met Gala. And so we've connected ever since then and been good friends. Here, Sylvan is talking about when things get tough, they do a couple things. One, reevaluate their creative priorities and two, turn their attention away from their inner self and towards their community of loved ones. I go by Sylvan and my pronouns are they, he. I recently shared a social media post that began, I'm always surprised by how disappointed I am when I've put time, vision, and effort into a proposal or submission, met the deadlines, followed the instructions, shared my best work, and I get the, we didn't pick you email. This was the most engaged post I've ever shared. 
with so many wise comments and so much identification. I've been writing more about this wrestling with disappointment, and I'm glad to share some of that here. So thanks, Zach. Franz Weller, grief activist and author of the book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, Rituals of Renewal and the Sacred Work of Grief, describes five gates through which grief enters our lives. And the fourth gate is what we expected and did not receive. The truth is, for much of the past year, I was envisioning a very different new chapter. And I invested an enormous portion of my time, care, art energy, and service in places and partnerships with people that didn't match or weren't able to share the building of relationships and the opportunities as I'd hoped. As a full-time school administrator, trying also to be a mid-career artist and, and an engaged activist with a loving home and midlife health practices to attend as well, I'd worked hard to be the best me, carefully squeezing commitments into my challenging calendar, trying to be upfront about what I could or couldn't manifest, and often turning myself to what I believed would help solidify the work and the way forward. I know this about myself, that I put in extra effort to avoid being disappointed in others, and that this old coping strategy leaves me sometimes failing to ask the out loud questions that might have helped me or even disinterest that I'm trying to face with a hidden hypervigilance trying to avoid disappointment. The more I care, the harder it is to risk the ache of having them disappoint me or reject what I'm offering and preparing. In Atlas of the Heart, Brene Brown examines the connection between disappointment and expectations. She writes, disappointment is unmet expectations. The more significant the expectations, the more significant the disappointment. When we develop expectations, we paint a picture in our head of how things are gonna be and how they're gonna look. We set expectations based not only on how we fit in the picture, but also on what those around us are doing in the picture. That we come away from the experience of disappointment and feeling bad about ourselves and the other person. Our negativity is tinged with the astonishment and surprise, and at the same time, we're trying to forgive, we're concealing the emotions. I know I've had some stellar opportunities over the last few years, and so I can feel this ache as also a kind of a lack of gratitude or even character weakness. But there's something about saying the hard part out loud, the feelings of being let down or excluded, the ways in which the time and effort felt like such a setup for disappointment. And when I name it out loud, as I did in the social media post, the transparency and truth-telling also brought the most generous and thoughtful connections with other artists in many different fields. A former student described advice she'd received to call this collecting rejection letters as a way of showing your work. And I've been reflecting on how to better budget for disappointments, to build into the processes of applying for shows, residencies, and career opportunities that are, of course, highly competitive and offering very few actual acceptances, to build in a kind of recognition of what I can realistically afford to risk in terms of energy and potential outcomes. The old, you can't be selected if you don't apply is true, but there might be also other labor that could yield better potentials that I want to make sure I'm prioritizing. I think what I'm trying to establish as a personal practice is the kind of middle way that Brene Brown describes in Atlas of the Heart. She writes, there is research that shows that one way to minimize disappointment is to lower our expectations. True, optimism can sometimes lead to increased disappointment, and I believe these findings are accurate. But there is a middle path, a way to maintain expectations and stay optimistic that requires more courage and vulnerability. Examine and express our expectations. There are far too many people in the world today who decide to live disappointed rather than risk feeling disappointed. I certainly want to reach my artistic and life goals, and I know that it is going to require resilience and a healthier approach to the risk of disappointment. And finally, one of my best personal practices, when I find myself feeling underseen or missing out on what I wanted to achieve, is to increase my care and attention for others. I step up in the activism and I take time to highlight the work of other artists. And that usually reduces the sting or slight I'm trying to weather. I remind myself that the artist I am is generous and community engaged. I remind myself that the artist I am is generous and community engaged. I think I need to write that on a post-it note and <laughs> stick it on my bathroom mirror. Up next is a clip from a Backstitch episode with Weaver Jennifer Mao. Y'all know I love those Backstitch episodes because it's like the 
first conversation I have with the guests is kind of like an awkward first date sometimes, right? Uh, I mean, wonderful and warm and beautiful, but you know, it's just, it's the first time you're talking to somebody, you're getting to know each other. Then time passes and the second date, you're already starting with the foundation. And so they're warm, they're vulnerable. And this conversation with Jennifer Mao really exemplifies how relationships are built over time. Here, Jen offers us a really raw insight into what it feels like as an artist, as a maker, not to be on fire, not to feel inspired all the time. In fact, when Jen and I reconnected, she readily admits that she's in a bit of a lull. But wait till she tells you about how mushrooms comes into all of this. And so, you know, I've been for the past few months not doing as much weaving or not doing as much or making as much work as I normally do. And in other ways, I've been doing a lot, right? I've been spending a lot of time outside. I've been being in community with people. I've been living a life, right? And so that's something that I'm really thinking about a lot these days is what does it mean when you're in a place where you're not moving quote unquote forward and when does that indicate stagnancy and the indication that maybe you need to do something different, you know, that your body and your mind and, the, you know, the world is giving you signs? Like, when is it a sign of, of stagnancy? And when is that an indication that it's something that you should stick with, right? Like, oh, just because something is feeling hard or sticky does not necessarily mean that you're not on the right path. Right. Um, and so those two things are in tension with one another and outwardly it looks exactly the same, right? That you're standing still. So I think I'm sitting a lot with that feeling right now. Well, how do you begin to sort all that out for yourself? Like, how are you feeling, I guess, emotionally about not weaving as much as you used to? Yeah. So I think that I have a lot of internalized stuff around productivity or what it means to be moving in a good direction, right? So the idea that, all right, progress is linear. And from year one to year two, year two to year three, there's going to be sort of this clear through line. Sometimes that's the case and sometimes it really isn't. So I think that's one thing that I'm really trying to pause and interrogate. So as I'm feeling things like, oh gosh, like why aren't I feeling more excited? Or I should sit down at the loom to weave because once you get started, then of course this like, excitement takes over, right? So you have all of those woulda, coulda, shouldas. And then I feel like I have to just take a step back to say, and also it's completely fine to do nothing. So that has always felt really hard for me to do, not only in artistic practice, but in life. So in some ways, when these kind of sticky feelings are bubbling up, part of it for me is just trying to name it and sit with it. Instead of really trying to think about, okay, how do I work through this? Or how do I move through this? So that's something that I'm thinking a lot about. So what, what name are you giving it at this point in time as we're talking today? Is the name stagnancy or is it rest or is it space or is it something else? Yeah. Hmm. I think if I were to describe it now, it wouldn't be any of those things per se. I think I feel like right now I'm in a liminal space. I feel on the cusp or on the threshold between one thing and the other. And I'm not exactly sure what's on the other side yet, right? And so this feeling of, I wouldn't say aimlessness or directionless, but this feeling I have a sense that 
when we connect a year and eight months from now, I'll be able to look back, right, and say, ah, with this perspective that I now have that was impossible for me to have in the moment, I really now see that that was one step that was necessary to get to whatever is coming next. And right now, I have no idea what's coming next. And that feels exciting. It feels scary. It feels like a lot of things. Okay, but I'm so excited for you when you said liminal space and I think threshold and I think the next thing, the unknown, that's so, that is exciting because I wonder, I've wondered this before and I'd be curious your thoughts on it too. Like does, does a weaver need to weave to be a weaver? Does a quilter need mm. to quilt to be a quilter? Does an artist need to make art to be an artist? Mm. Yeah. You know, okay, this is getting me excited because like I mentioned before, one thing that I have not been doing is weaving but I've been spending a lot of time outdoors and a lot of time just thinking. And one of the things that I did last weekend is I took a foraging walk in the woods with the Outdoor Institute out in the Catskills, who, by the way, I would highly recommend if you're interested in this type of thing. And Laura led us through the forest and introduced us to different mushrooms, being able to identify different trees and plants. And one thing that really stuck out to me when she was talking about how to properly harvest a mushroom is that the mushroom is the fruiting body of this really vast mycelium network that is invisible and underneath our feet. And so her point in saying this is you don't have to worry that you're going to hurt the mushroom by plucking it because it is akin to picking an apple off the tree. You're just seeing the visible fruits, but the tree is still there. The mycelium is still there. And so as she was talking about this, I was really thinking about the metaphor between mycelium or even thinking about the environment or like the terroir that parallel with creative work, right? Which is that the fruits or the mushrooms are the things that you make. And there is always this network of things happening beneath the soil that is, it's necessary to nourish that piece or that network or those ideas or whatever it is that is the environment that makes it possible for you to create work, for you to do it. And so I've been thinking about this summer or this period of quote unquote stagnancy is that moment that, all right, I'm nourishing my mycelium, right? I'm, I'm really tending to the things that will make it possible eventually for me to make something else, even though I don't know what that thing is yet. I love that. I love that. Yeah, because I think that, I think for a long time, I thought an artist was more of a, an occupation right? It was a thing that one did. Mm -hmm. But when I left my occupation of teaching and I stepped into this role as full-time artist that I so enjoy now, I felt like I wasn't stepping into a job, but rather into a brand new space and way of being. Mm. The proof of that is not in what is produced. I think I would say that an artist isn't someone who makes art, but rather who connects dots together. And that can happen underground, subliminally, undetected, right? So, yeah, at this point in my life, I'm leaning towards, yes, that a weaver can be a weaver without weaving. And a quilter can be a quilter without quilting. Because our minds, the thing that really makes the art, the thing that really makes the work, is still active, right? Yeah, Yeah, definitely. I think I'm with you on this point, Zach. And your thought makes me immediately think about Rick Rubin's book. And he has such a great working definition of an artist as not an occupation, but the way in which you show up in the world, right? The way in which you pay attention to stuff. And it has less to do with the thing you produce or the thing that you make. And I love that framing because 
it takes so much pressure off in some ways, right? So, and and I think too, we have all of these kind of cultural, not hangups, but all of these cultural ideas and mythologies around what being an artist is. And if you boil it down to, well, if you're paying attention, if you are thinking about things in a certain way, you don't have to worry about the work. You're already an artist, right? And um, yeah, I'm curious whether that comes up or how that comes up on the nook, right? I, I think too, for people who, you know, are in craft related work, sometimes there's this like, sometimes there is a feeling that you need to downplay what you're doing. Like, oh, I'm just, I'm just knitting. I'm just like making my cute little crafts. There's a way in which in being modest, people downplay the work that they make, how much they're paying attention, the dots that they're connecting. So yeah, I, I'm with you. You can be, you can be an artist and having not made a thing, you can be a weaver if you don't weave, you can be a quilter if you don't quilt. And I think it does us as makers and artists a disservice to downplay our own work in the sense that just last night on the Nook, we were having a sew-in circle and you never know what we're going to talk about. You know, it's open forum. Any, anybody can raise any topic they want to discuss. But in, on this particular time, things just got real. Real in the way that some people might call heavy or depressing or a downer or whatever. But we were talking about things that everybody experiences, life, death, disappointment, loss, grief, all these things. And I was participating in the conversation, but I was also just witnessing the conversation. And it was so fascinating to me that here's this group of textile people. And some of us know each other better than others, you know, of course, in, in a group that size. But we were seamlessly pivoting between textiles and life experience. And we just kept going back and forth in a way that felt very natural and very mm -hmm. easy. And I think for the first time in my mind, at least this clearly, I saw that one of the things that makes textiles so special that way, so intimate that way, is that as humans, we have chosen to incorporate textiles into some of our most memorable, notable life events, right? Mm -hmm. A baby's born, what do you wrap it up in, right? Uh, you're graduating, what do you wear, right? You're getting married, what does that look like? You go into a hospital, what do you wear there? And at the very end, I mean, one of the, my most recent memories of the importance of textiles is when my grandma passed away recently. And my cousin and I got to go into her closet and have a little fashion show and like, oh, we think we should bury grandma on this. We think we should bury grandma on that. I mean, we made light of it. But it just gets to the point that when we encounter, when we experience some of our biggest life's moments as humans, we don't have to look too far to find textiles. They're right there within arm's reach. And so when we say, oh, I'm just sewing, I'm just weaving, I'm just knitting, it's not only downplaying this way that you've chosen to spend your time, but I wonder if in a way that also minimizes our own lived experiences. That I wonder to what extent the things that we make and the things we experience in our lives are connected and one and the same. And can we talk about our work and our lives in a way that's mutually respectful of, of each other? Can we, for example, downplay our work but still respect our lived experience? I'm just asking a question. I don't know the answer to that. How's that landing mm -hmm. with you? Yeah, one, one thing that that makes me think of is the idea that we are inevitably always our worst critics, right? The things that we would say of ourselves, of our own work, of our own lives is never what we would say to a friend doing the same thing, right? So the idea that really sticks in my mind now is how can you be 
kind to yourself and a good friend to yourself in the ways that you show up for others naturally through the course of your life. And I'm thinking about this because a couple of weeks ago, I was thinking about this a lot. And a quote that I encountered was from the philosopher Seneca. And the quote was, what progress, you ask, have I made? I have begun to be a friend to myself. And I love that, right? Because I was thinking so much about stagnancy. I was thinking so much about what am I even doing? And the idea of trying to know myself, trying to nourish the network, the mycelium network that makes it possible for me to make things, to be a friend to myself and having that in and of itself be such an accomplishment is what I, yeah, is really, really sticking with me these days. Will you read us that piece of wisdom one more time, please? Yeah. So the quote is from the philosopher Seneca, and he says, what progress, you ask, have I made? I have begun to be a friend to myself. On the second reading, the word begun really stuck out to me. It's a process, right? Like it's, you don't have to be in any one place. You're already there. You're tumbling forward, whether you realize it or not, and you're becoming. Yeah, I think it also really talks about the idea that your relationship with yourself is consistently ongoing. And it's the easiest thing to ignore because it feels one in the same, like, oh, I am just me. But yeah, a lot of, in the same way that you have to nourish your relationships with other people, got to nourish your relationship with yourself too. What did I tell y'all about mushrooms? Isn't that a beautiful idea to think about? That even when we can't see the fruits of our creative practice, we can trust that there is a mycelial network deep within us still doing the work processing thoughts, feeling the feelings, all the things. And so if you find yourself in a place where maybe at the moment you don't feel so creatively inspired, like Jen was sharing, one thing I know that helps me quite a bit is to think about what Julia Cameron calls an artist state, right? If you haven't read The Artist Way, highly recommend it. She has two big recommendations. One is morning pages, the idea of consistently writing in your journal nonstop for, I believe, a half hour. The second recommendation Julia Cameron has is the idea of the artist state, and that is taking yourself out somewhere to feed your creative soul, to fill your well, I believe is how she says it. So maybe that's going to a museum, a gallery. Maybe that's going to a creative reuse store. Maybe that's just walking around the park or going for a hike. You know what feeds you. So do that. Your mycelial network will be so happy. And when the time is right and the moon is right and the water's right, and every condition has aligned, that network will once again bear fruit. We can't wrap up this year and review and year looking forward without mentioning my good friend, Lou Gardner, embroiderer from the UK who passed away this year from cancer. Lou was a lighthouse, a force of nature. She had a silk scarf pinned up on the wall behind her when we were talking last for Seamside that said love is a cosmic phenomenon and Lou truly was and remains a cosmic phenomenon. In this clip I pulled for us, Lou and I are talking about capes because we both made one. I've made a fun little mandala cape that I tell you about in this clip, but Lou took it to the next level. So let's hear what Lou has to say about the role of capes, textiles, and embroidery and making people feel powerful and loved. So why capes, Lou? Why are you why are you getting in on capes? <laughs> I don't know anybody else making capes. Oh, it's really weird. Well, it started because I was commissioned by um, a British company to make an artwork to celebrate womankind. And I sort of scratched my head for a few months. And I thought, I can't really just make a wall-based piece that something the, the project was all about celebrating womankind and the feminine and and it just seemed a bit daft to kind of choose a figurative image and because I had done a lot of figurative work until that point but I, I couldn't do anything that was universal enough so I eventually thought you know could this be something else I went up to see my mum and dad in Cheshire who 
I mean, this is what, 2017, so it's five years ago. They're both in their late 70s. And there was the first ever female superhero film, Wonder Woman, on at the cinema. And it was really naff and ridiculous, but I loved it. I mean, I, I, I just loved the ridiculousness of it and the fact that it was finally a superhero film with a woman um, as, the, as, the, as the hero heroine hero I don't know what you say these days it's not never quite sure the fact that she sort of jumped out of weirdly out of world tour world war ii trenches you know and then sort of swept her hair to one side and had a full face of perfect makeup (laughs) was a bit disappointing but it kind of you know, I sat between my mum and dad and we were both kind of raising our arm like a, you know, punch fist bumping the air and going, Whoo! and then um, I just thought, oh my God, I'm going to make a cape. I'm going to make something that celebrates people. I want to wrap them up and celebrate them and protect them and nurture them and surround them in love. So I just went to this, this um, company and I just said, how about I make a superhero cape for women? to celebrate women. And that's how it started. Well, and I heard you say in an interview at some point too, that one of the things this cape does is it turns the wear into the artwork. I don't know if I'm quoting you exactly, but is that the idea? Yeah, yeah, you've done your homework. I was really looking forward to this conversation although I've been getting ready. (laughs) Oh, that's so nice. So I have made one cape in my day as well. I've made it in the last year. And it was, I was doing for a long time a daily mandala drawing practice. Nice. So I'd, I've had, I mean, for a decade, I've had like a daily journaling practice. And so I just lumped in a mandala drawing practice. Towards the end, after several months of drawing a daily mandala, I decided I want to turn it into a textile piece, into a quilt. I think being informed by all the circles I had been drawing, I was like, I'll make a circular quilt, which I had never done before. And then from there, I was like, well, what if I could wear it? And so I cut a hole in the middle of it for my head. It's just like a giant poncho, basically. Yeah. You know, imagine like a giant fabric donut. You just, I, just... I so know what you mean. <laughs> but what I love about it is, so for that project for me is, it's kind of like my personal mythology, my personal narrative, right? That yeah. through the exploration of the mandala and the work that I've been doing, um, one of the ways I see myself is kind of like the, the keeper of the lighthouse, you know, and not the only keeper of the only lighthouse. There, there are many of us out there doing the same work. But I have a little yeah. lighthouse that I tend to, and I'm just spreading that light out into the world and helping people find yeah. a way. You know, yeah. That's how I see myself, at least. And so the, this mandala cape is that lighthouse, is that light yeah. spreading out and the joy going out. The big smile is the, is the light at the yeah. top. Yeah. And so when, when you put it on, it literally puts you in the center, puts me in the center of that universe. Right. It yeah. puts it puts my head at what would be the 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 light of the lighthouse. And so it becomes yes. interactive in that way, positional, geographic in that way. Yeah. And sort of um ceremonial, which is so important at the moment. Get back to ceremony and the simple acts that can ground you and connect you. For so many reasons. Um, some of the reasons would be that in a lot of ways, we don't have a common set of traditions anymore. You know, we live in multicultural societies. Certain traditions are just kind of fallen by the wayside that used to provide for us a lot of structure and comfort and support, gave us a sense of a roadmap of moving through yeah. life. And so we need, I feel like the artist, one of our roles in the society is to help people see a new roadmap. Yeah. And if somebody sees my work and they don't like that roadmap, well, then that roadmap's not for them. But if they do see what I'm doing and it resonates something yeah. in them, well, then let's walk down that road together. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think it's, yeah, it's about having the courage to to stick to your with your belief system because, yeah, God, I'm all full of the quotes today. But there's another quote where, um, he who does not howl will not find his pack. I love it. And it's, um, I love that quote because it's, I can you know, imagine this wolf, you know, you can imagine a wolf that never howled. What a waste of a wolf. <laughs> Lou, I think the neighborhood coyotes knew that we were going to be talking today and that you were going to say that because I haven't heard them howl at night in a, weeks. And I heard one lone coyote last night. Oh, Did you howl back? Well, I was in my bed. Oh, howl anyway. <laughs> <laughs> 
they must have really good hearing. So just have a little howl in bed. <laughs> there you go. I will next time. Well, next time you wear time. your lovely cape, good howl in your cape. I hope you found these seamside selections inspiring, motivating, and insightful, helping put you on the right path for a productive and satisfying 2024. Between now and the next time we meet, if you're looking for some creative company, maybe a little accountability in the new year, maybe you want to push your creative boundaries. Remember, there's always the nook. The door is open and we are ready for you. So come by anytime. You can find a link to your free trial in the show notes below. Until then, I hope you're up to something good. I hope you're sowing something good. And I hope to see you soon, maybe in the nook. Who knows?